Okay, and we already have uh, people coming in. Mm. Um, Hello, people coming in. Welcome. <laughs> so, and welcome again. Uh, well, welcome for the first time to the public audience. Yeah. Uh, the public stage. You and I had a private chat a few months ago or a few weeks ago, and it was amazing. But welcome to Crowd Contents Fireside Chat. We have been now mm. bringing amazing speakers for the last uh, few months just to continue to bring value to our audience and really just share best practices mm. and talk about what's going on in the content marketing marketing world, um, content writing world, um, and SEO world. So welcome, Anne. I think you don't need a lot of introduction because I'm sure a lot of people is, um, is already uh, already known you for your work. Your, uh, Anne is a best-selling author from Every, Everybody Writes, right? And Everybody Writes 2 came out last year, I think, December. Uh, so, yep. uh, and also, uh, I, I, wanna, I don't want to use the word influencer because, again, it has been a little bit... Um, uh, <laughs> Depreciated lately, but I think you're a thought leader in the content marketing industry um, and in the and in the writing industry. So a lot of people look up to you, including uh, myself. So thank you for accepting our invitation, and it's great having you here. Mm, so, my gosh, uh, it's so wonderful having you here. And I just realized that I, I forgot that it's a fireside chat. And where is the fire? So I guess I'm gonna have to bring it, and and you too. So <laughs> yeah, bring, bring the fire. Bring, bring the fire, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's funny. There is there is um, a filter that had a fireside chat and we yeah. use it once and I mean the technology didn't work quite well so we stopped <laughs> doing that because uh, uh, yeah we wanted to be clever and uh, didn't work out but let me start this conversation sharing something here really quick because I think people will appreciate um, appreciate this uh, this this post from social media just I, I don't know this <laughs> this is April's fool but everybody prompts. 10% more artificial, new and machine made by Roomba. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit that, about this? I thought it was brilliant. It was very, very yeah. funny. So um, yeah. I, I just get it off the screen, um, but I just wanted to show it to the audience real quick. Um, I get it off the screen so people can see you. Um, yeah, what, <laughs> what, prompted, what prompted that? Uh, Fantastic. That um, yeah, what prompted that was, so this is the, this is the book, if you have not seen the book, um, then it kind of puts puts that everybody prompts title in context. And, you know, this is a robot in my renovated space. Um, I drew that with a Sharpie, by the way. I know it seems like that that was like a professional graphic that was made by some kind of high-end agency in Manhattan, <laughs> but no friends. It was just me and my Sharpie. Um, so oh, yeah, and the backstory on that is that, uh, you know, one of the things that I noticed around the explosion of chat GPT and the, you know, in the, the dawn of AI tools in marketing is that suddenly everybody is talking about writing, you know, and, and when I first published everybody writes eight years ago, and then even when I came out with the second edition this past fall, uh, late fall, some of the commentary that I got was, well, yeah, but this is the age of, you know, fireside chats with Carlos. And this is the age of, you know, live video and Instagram reels and TikTok, like writing. How does that even, how is that even relevant? Well, then, you know, within a couple months, suddenly like we're all about writing and we're all about trying to use machines to create better content and to really elevate our own writing capabilities. And so, um, so that's kind of why I, I, th I, I loved the fact that we're now talking about writing more, but of course, you know, to, in order to get the best work out of these machines, sometimes we need to prompt them correctly. Um, and so just as a joke, I ended up creating that cover with a Sharpie. But the funny thing about that is that so many people said, oh, I was like going to my Amazon account to like to buy that. And it's like, <laughs> oh, you know, granted now most of them are not in the US who commented that. So they weren't aware of maybe the April Fool's tie in. But yeah, I'm as I probably will never write that book. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> yeah, some of your fans are going to be disappointed. At your yeah, name. I love the chatter <laughs> here, by the way, Colton thought it was Picasso for a second there. You know, thank you. Yeah, I have gotten that. If marketing yeah. doesn't work out for me, I feel like I have a career in Sharpies. That's the way that I think about it. Yeah, but I thought, you know, there is a little bit of satire as well. And, and, and some, some something I think it was very profound in a way, right? Because I know uh, it, it was joke. It was uh, um, April Fool. But I, I think now with 
all that noise around chat GPT. Now everybody's an expert all of a sudden in AI yeah. and, <laughs> in, yeah. uh, and in writing as well. But I, I really, so you're, you're a writer, you're an author, of course. Um, I want to just hear your, your thoughts. Just share, share with, with us and our audience, like in this now new world that new, because it's just in November, all this craziness kind of um, started. I think mm-hmm. generative AI has been around for a while, but uh, chat GPT kind of really, Open the Pandora's box, and now uh, is is the new is the new the new thing. So, what are you your thoughts? What is the place of AI and AI writing in in the world of marketing, the world of writing? Um, oh my goodness! That is, yeah, I mean that is such a big question right now, isn't it? And I think it's something that we all of us in in marketing are thinking about and and struggling with. I don't have all the answers, you know. Maybe I'm like a lot of experts on LinkedIn who say that they do. No shade, maybe they figured it out, but honestly, this is like a big revolution, right? And I don't use that word lightly. I do think that it's really changed the way that we are going to be thinking about our our content for the better and for the worse. And so, you know, in terms of how I think about it, sometimes like, you know, Carlos, honestly, sometimes it changes, you know, know, day to day, hour to hour. Um, I shared a story with, um, with the, my subscribers of my email newsletter, which comes out every other Sunday. And I shared a story about how um, uh, I was corresponding with Paul Rotzer, who is uh, the founder president of the Marketing AI Institute. He's all about AI. He's been following this stuff for years. You know, he was early in on it. Um, and he's, he, I was, we were corresponding back and forth because I spoke at his event last week. And at one point I got an autoresponder and the autoresponder said something like, you know, um, this is chat GPT-4 answering on behalf of Paul. I am out, uh, I'm out of the office. I'm speaking at events, uh, AI events across the country um, about, you know, uh, large language models and opportunities for marketing as well as sentient toaster ovens. And it was that last phrase, the sentient toaster ovens. And oh, and then then parenthetically, it said after that, just kidding about the sentient toaster ovens and another paragraph, but parenthetical aside, or am I? And it was like, like all written by chat GPT for, it had nothing to do with Paul. I mean, he put the prompt in that said, I'm going to be speaking, use some humor, but that was it. And it was really eye-opening for me in the sense that I suddenly felt like, oh my God, because that's something that I would have written, you know, something that would invoke the rule of three in that situation. So two normal things, you know, large language models and implications for marketing. And then this thing that's randomly out of right field, right, or left field, uh, which is the sentient toaster oven line. That kind of structure is something that I would have said, and it's a joke I probably would have made. And it just really rocked me to my core. (laughs) And I thought, oh my God, this thing can write as well as I do, at least it can produce an out of office message as funny as something that I might create. And I really had to wrestle with that for for a few minutes. Um, Actually, it wasn't just a few minutes, it was a sleepless night that I had, if I'm being totally honest, and I am. Um, And so all that to say, you know, it's, I think there are opportunities with AI, and there are also some things that concern me about it. The opportunities, I think, is that it can be a great intern, (laughs) I guess is kind of where I've settled to. I think you you do have to know how to write in order to be a good partner for any kind of AI solution or any AI tool. Um, I don't think it's going to magically fix all of your marketing. On the other side, I worry that there's going to be a whole lot of mediocre content that is going to be created, a whole lot of sort of mediocre writing because people are going to see it as a as like a microwave that they can just pop some words in and like out comes a Thanksgiving dinner or out comes like a, a full meal. And it's not, it's not that. I, I see it as an intern. I see it as a, a kind of research partner. I see it as a, as a buddy on the days when I'm feeling kind toward it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I think there is some complexities in it. Yeah. No, I, you know what, I, I like that, um, that point that, that you made. And I was just, remi- uh, uh, it reminded me of an article that Rand Fishkin put out last mm-hmm. week. Yes. Saying that AI was the new bar, right? So AI written content is a new bar. And if, that if you cannot produce something better than the AI, you, you shouldn't even be writing. Right. right? Right. It is a threat to mediocre writers, I think, who have just been sort of like, you know, who have just sort of been coasting along. I think that 
what I saw Rand's post, I thought it was really great because what it does, it calls all of us to a higher place, doesn't it? And it elevates content, I hope. The, the reality is that may not happen everywhere and in every industry and in every vertical, but you know, I do think he's right because um, the bar for writers is, is certainly there, but I hope that, that companies and, and people really take advantage of what I think is an opportunity to really level up our content and our writing. Yeah, and I also think that uh, now everybody has these machine gun of content. So we're going to get a lot of, we're going to get bombarded by, because again, I think as humans, we sometimes want to go to least path, the, the, the path of least resistance. Oh, yeah. We're all really lazy people. Yeah. I mean, 100%. <laughs> yeah. So now oh, everybody, these machine guns of, of content, we're going to get inundated with, uh, with these me mediocre content that just, is, is training itself so it's just the same the same on its own so um anyway i i i hope that this is an opportunity for people to like you said level up mm -hmm. and really bring up their 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 best game in in terms of content there was yeah yeah, yeah. and i'd be sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you go ahead no no, no. i was just um gonna move into a, the point that we were talking before about using running to think but um what were you gonna say before oh no i was just gonna say that you know i almost i and i also think that there's an imperative for brands for and for writers to think you know how can we truly show that like we are we are putting our um like that that our brand is infused in a piece of writing or in a piece of content you know we have to make sure that our that it feels like it could only come from us. So that means we think about our brand voice. We think about who is is writing the content um, because I think the who behind the writing is is really critical right now. Because in a world where, as you just said, you know, robots are able to create content just um, you know with, with the push of a button, then I think you know what does that mean? Like, how do we level up as brands? Well, I think it means that we have to be really clear about what our point of view is and and how we use our our brand voice to express it. Yeah, that's a great point, and I think brand voice and tone uh, mm -hmm. are going to become so much now even more important. It, it's always been important, I think. Yeah. Some people didn't give them the importance that they deserve, but um, smart brands have, have put a lot of um, effort and thought into it. But going forward, what what do you think people should really think about when they're thinking about brand voice and tone? This term gets thrown around loosely, but I don't know if everybody understands what does that mean. And you read content out there that you don't know, uh, uh, it's not consistent or you don't know, it, it, you, you cannot relate it with brand or with the, with, or with the product. So uh, can you give us some more thoughts around that? Yeah. So, you know, brand voice can feel very inaccessible, you know, it can feel very literary and, and kind of high minded, like it's like up here somewhere that, and maybe some, you know, agency somewhere once created some brand voice guidelines for you. But, you know, the reality, it's just how you sound to the voice uh, or, or when you speak or when you write, it's this, the way you sound in the head of your prospect, reader, you know, the recipient of your email, someone who comes to your website and looks at your um, homepage or looks at your FAQ pages or is trying to figure out, um, you know, how do I get customer service? It's all of those things. So it's, the, it's, it's not just, it's who you are and it's how the work gets done and it's how you signal to your customers, your prospects that, you know, you are there for them. Um, and so, yeah, that's really all brand voice is. And I think, as you say, it's so critical when we think about, you know, where robots write in, like if you've ever experimented with chat GPT, and I'm sure everybody here has, um, you know, it's fun, it's fun to play with. But the thing that's weird about it, or the thing that I've noticed about it, is that it, it doesn't really have a tone of voice. I mean, yeah, you can say, like, write this in the style of, you know, I don't know, uh, Brene Brown or Seth Godin or, um, you know, almost almost anybody who has a published public body of work. But it's, you know, it's not, it's what, what use is that? Like, I think what we want to do is make it sound like it could only come from us. And that to me is going to be a really important skill and a really important thing to remember about our content um, in this yeah. new AI world. Yeah, and I want to revisit that in a second, but um, first I want to talk now about challenges that you see. And mm. I know you you collected some great stats, um, and, I, and it would be great if you can share some some of those thoughts of what are the challenges and 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 some of those things that that you've been researching uh, in preparation for this for this chat. 
Yeah, for um, well, not about AI per se, but um, you know, every year, Marketing Props and uh, and the Content Marketing Institute, we partner on a content marketing research study. I think this is our eleventh or twelfth year um, of doing it. It comes out every fall, almost to coincide with Content Marketing World um, in the start of event season in the fall. Um, and every year we ask the same question so that we can get benchmarks year over year. And so in our most recent um, bit of research, we asked marketers, you know, what are you using? What kinds of content assets are you using? And so I have a, this is another chart that was um, created by AI. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. This is like, again, and with a Sharpie, you can see. So, oh, so here, here's the um, here's what the most research uh, the most recent research shows. We asked actually, it's not best assets. I meant to cross that out. These are just what marketers used um, in 2022, heading into 2023. So you can see right here, short short blog posts or short posts could be so, uh, not social media, but short posts on websites. Um, video, of course, at 70, what is that, 75% yeah. there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. of course, that makes total sense. Case studies, 67%. Webinars, like this one, makes total sense, 62%. Um, data visualization, so that may include infographics, it could be charts, or it could be any kind of, you know, any kind of uh, data visualization. 61% uh, tied with long articles, so long form articles. So this is what marketers used, right? But then we also asked them, well, what actually worked? Which I think is actually also very telling when you when you look at these two next to each other. Events, right? Oh, wow. Yeah, right at the top there, 48%, not virtual events, live events, so in-person events. Part of this, of course, may be driven by the fact that, oh my God, the world, we can finally get together again, right? After being in our home offices, sequestered away for, for years. Um, virtual events, not too far behind at 47%. Um, and then finally research, right, at 46%. So these are the three things that, that kind of worked, um, which is interesting, right? Um, then we also asked marketers, well, what are your biggest challenges as relates to the content that you are producing? Um, and these were the top three challenges that they shared. Number one, content to match the stages. Whoops. Content to match the state match the stages of a of a buyer's journey, right, or a, a prospect's journey. The second thing is aligning sales and marketing at fifty percent. Like this, this appears on the list every single yeah. year. Yeah, the quintessential challenge. It is. It's the quintessential <laughs> challenge, and I would actually argue with that fifty. But okay, I'm gonna yeah. let it go. Um, and then the last one here at forty three percent, basically. Uh, how do we actually measure? I'm like looking at it because I can't see through this page. Um, how do we actually measure the content, the effectiveness of the content? How do we actually know that it's working? But what's more than that, how do we agree on what the, like, what are we measuring? How do we agree on the KPI? You know, is it just website traffic or is it, you know, is it an actual sale? Is it a, subs a subscriber? Like there's, a, there's so many ways that you can measure the effectiveness of that. Um, and I noticed that Brian Piper is in the audience today and Everyone here today, if you do not have a copy of Brian's last book um, with Joe Polizzi, actually, Brian, I think, is it your first book? I don't know. I might be wrong about that. Um, but Brian Piper and Joe Polizzi put out a book um, recently called Epic Content Marketing. It's a second edition. They talk a lot about KPIs in there in terms of aligning uh, teams around the, the right ones. Um, so anyway, 11 out of 10 would recommend awesome. that. Um, well, yeah, but anyway. Marketing. Yeah. But back to the challenges piece, what, what is also funny to me when I look at a chart like this, and I pulled the stats this morning in anticipation of our conversation here today, um, this, <laughs> you know, of course, AI wasn't even on our radar when we fielded this research study last summer. Um, I mean, it was, but we didn't know, how could you know, that it was going to just explode the way that it did. So my sense is that I will make a prediction right now on the record that how to figure out um, AI, how do we embrace it as part of our marketing programs? How do we align um, our organization around it? How do we implement it in our teams? What do we do with AI in general is probably gonna jump to number number one um, in terms of the challenges for marketers next year. But you know, again, this is what happens when you field a research study in the summer and then 
a bomb goes off in the middle of marketing and at the end of December. Right? Yeah, no, I've seen, you know, people in, in, in LinkedIn that go to con that speak at conference and they, they keep complaining about, you know, now there is something new. I have to, to change my, my slides. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Every day it's because crazy. something new comes yeah. up. But yeah. thanks for the stats, Anne. Um, absolute fantastic uh, information and data to um, inform our audience of, of what's going on out there. I was yes. um, really, really, um, what caught my eye is the challenge around matching uh, messaging to different stages. Was that, did I? Oh, did yeah, I, yeah. Yes, right here, the first uh, one. And by the way, you're a great designer. Uh, Thank and you. So <laughs> Thank they, you. They look like, like you, you got somebody to make them so oh thank you really are you just yeah. saying that yeah, yeah. No, i just realized look at the coordination here too it's amazing yeah, it's, it's like almost planned um but yeah let's talk a little bit about that the content um because i think when when, when i talk to clients and, and businesses um marketers some marketers don't understand the differences in the stages in the funnel the buyer's journey mm -hmm. and they're just thinking okay i need to put out a blog i need to put out a uh, so they think about the asset they're, they're, they're not thinking about this thing. So they, they're really thinking about the tactic rather, rather than strategy. So can we speak a little bit about that, Anne, and how you mm. think about it? Yeah, I love that. Um, yes, and to me, a lot of that, you know, it's, it's funny, I was just having a conversation this morning um, with a, a company I'm gonna go in to speak to their, their marketing team um, around this exact idea, because, you know, it's, it's difficult to, um, to, we, well, uh, let me say it this way. We, we talk all the time about creating this sort of customer centric mindset within our marketing. We talk about how we wanna, we're going to like put the customer at the center of all we do. Um, but in reality, that's a very, very difficult thing to do. And, you know, it's, it's, it's hard for all of us. It's not like I'm, I'm not saying it's hard for you in marketing. I'm saying it's hard for me, too. It's like it's a very difficult thing to do. Because we are, well, most of us anyway, have really got to work on that empathy piece of it, right? We've got to really think about what does my customer need at this particular moment? And what that means is you've got to like map it out. Like, okay, so if they just come to your website for the very first time, you know, what is that experience like for them? When they come to the site, do they, do they immediately see imagery that makes them feel like they're part of it? Do they immediately, is the tone of voice accessible and does it feel like it's speaking directly to them? Um, there's little signals that all of us will, will encode almost reflexively. Like, do I, does this seem like a company that I can like and that I can trust? And so, you know, that's like right at the top of the funnel and that's on the homepage. And I think it's important to go through that exercise to figure out like, are we actually speaking directly to the mindset of a customer on all of our channels, on all of our pages? You know, can we put ourselves into their, into their shoes? Can we sort of slip on their skin and, and try to understand what is their point of view? What are they doing here? How can we help? And I think the thinking about things from that point of view will really go a long way toward creating content that will match their mindset versus, you know, taking a tactic centric approach, which is, you know, let's write a blog post, let's put out an infographic based on that blog post, let's take the webinar, this conversation that Carlos and I had and just like, you know, slice and dice it and put it out on social, like, that's all fine, but you've got to start with, what's our goal here? Who are we trying to influence? And, and how are we going to let them know that, you know, yes, this, we, you can, we are we are like you, right? How do we align with our customer at a deeper level? Yeah, no, that's uh, I, I couldn't agree more that uh, it's easy to say, yeah, we're customer centric. And it's again, lip service in uh, in many cases because everybody says, and you have to say, like, it's the right thing to say, right? But I don't know if a lot of people really understand what that means. Uh, and sometimes I think people can, can get confused about being kind with being nice. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you know, it being nice doesn't mean that you're trying to put yourself in the in, in somebody else's shoes, right? Yeah. It's not the same thing. But I like a term that you use, um, uh, and I think you, you you coined this term. And I said I said I'm going to borrow it for for my next my next um, conference. But pathological empathy, and I lo love that term because again, the the word empathy gets thrown around so much that it's kind of losing a little bit of its value. But uh, pathological empathy make, like makes some uh, create some dramatic effect. So. Can you uh, speak a little bit about that and what do you really mean by that? About pathological empathy? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Essentially what, you know, I, I, as I said a second ago, you know, I, I think it can be hard to 
look at the world from another's point of view. Um, there are a few people, or there are some people maybe who are naturally empathic, who can you know, really look at another person's situation and, and really step into their shoes. But I think thinking about things like to, to have a sort of pathologically empathic approach is, is so much more powerful, um, at least the way that I think about it, because essentially what that means is it's not just having an understanding of like, oh yeah, we, we get how, um, you know, somebody may be looking for telecom solutions for their small business, for example. It's like, all right, well, yeah, that kind of only goes so far, but then let's like, let's take it down another few levels, right? Let's like really get into, um, let, let's try to have a little bit more of an understanding of maybe what they're feeling at that point. Like they're scared because they're starting a new business. Maybe they're overwhelmed because they've just leased this office space and they're excited about their business, but they didn't realize they'd have to go through all this like operational, like, you know, hell in order to just, you know, get off the ground and send their first email. Um, and so pathological empathy really challenges all of us, I think, to think about things from your customer's point of view and you really you know, step inside their world um, and you really can uh, understand things differently, I think, when you, when you start there as opposed to just having a broad understanding. That's, by the way, one of the reasons why I don't love the idea of buyer personas. Like I get how they can be useful to marketers. We sort of have this look at the kind of person that we're trying to attract or, or connect with in marketing. But to me, like it's too much of a composite and it almost ends up looking like a, um, or feeling like a, like a police sketch, you know? It doesn't feel like a real person. It's Instead, it looks like this composite of person that's like the forehead doesn't quite look right and those ears, they look a little small and a little low. It's like, you know, you, know you see those, yeah, you look at those police sketches and you're like, mm, there's something a little bit off from that. And very often that's how I, I think of buyer personas as well. Um, I think it's much more useful to actually speak to your customers and to actually get an idea in your head of like, oh, there's this guy who is launching a, a floor cleaning company in our area. He's setting up shop. He needs a, like a telecom solution. Um, here's what he told me about, you know, kind of what he needs from us. It's like, Marketers don't speak to customers often enough. I mean, I, I wish we did. Um, and you've got to be very intentional about doing that. It's the only way I know to really understand another person's world is to keep asking those questions. That's a very interesting way to think about um, by your personas. Um, so yeah. how would you, so, because of course we cannot target every single customers and they're all a little bit different. So right. what would be your suggestion to tackle, you know, having that, kind of because the person is kind of that imaginary client that or customer that kind of fits different characters. Yeah. Like, yeah. So well, how, I mean, how, yeah. You... I mean, so, so the, that, that actual customer becomes a proxy for, you know, a kind of, a kind of business that you're trying to, to speak to, like, you're not going to be able to speak to every single customer, but I think there's value in, in sort of cherry picking those ones that will become a proxy for, uh, for how you are, communicating and, and how you're marketing. And just to give you like a very specific example of that. So, you know, as I mentioned, every other week I publish an email newsletter and every other Sunday when the email newsletter goes out, I write it in my head to a very specific person. So, you know, it, it may be you, Carlos, it may be Brian, it may be Colton here today because, you know, something that they said like sparked an, a thought or there's some maybe a question that they asked sparked me an, an answer from me. Um, and so, yeah, I don't start a, the email newsletter with a dear Colton or, um, or dear Brian or dear Carlos, but you like that, that person, an actual person becomes a proxy for a question that maybe other people like you have. And the reason why I, I make that distinction and why I even raise it as an important way to think about as a, as a content creator, an important mindset to have as a content creator, is because it just changes the way you communicate. It makes you much less like, you know, dear valued customers, I am here to show you a solution, a tool that you will really find valuable. You know, like you just drop that. I wouldn't speak to you that way. Like we're just having a conversation. <laughs> and so it makes my voice, my writing voice, my brand voice, if you will, um, a lot more loose and accessible, but it also makes me really hone in on what was he actually asking in that question? Like, what are the real challenges? What's the pain that I'm seeing through that question? 
Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of how I, I think about it. Awesome, I really love it. So I wanna be respectful of time and I know uh, it was scheduled for 30 minutes, but do we have a few more minutes? Because I wanna- Yeah, we have a few uh, minutes, yes. So can I ask you about your new book or the new, yeah. uh, everybody right? So what's new, um, what's different? What's uh, the punchline um, of that new book? Oh my goodness, it's right on the cover. Look at that, it says 10% funnier. <laughs> Right here, <laughs> it's ten percent funnier. Maybe uh, I have Brian is in the audience here. Maybe he can. Oh, Norman, thank you for putting the newsletter link in there. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's ten percent funnier. It's thicker. It has. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Brian. It has a. Um, it talks about just a whole lot more kinds of, uh, or, or talks about many more issues that are relevant to writing to content creation in in twenty twenty three. Um, when I wrote the first edition, it was eight years ago. And that, you know, I thought at the time that it was going to be a very evergreen book because writing is writing. Like what changes? Nothing changes. Writing is writing. But it turns out that actually writing does change. Writing evolves because we evolve as people and our culture evolves and, and all of it. Um, and not just because of AI, but because of our experiences in the world, because of a global pandemic, because of the way that uh, companies are suddenly all in on digital because of the pandemic, um, because of uh, the political environment in which we find ourselves doing business, right? So all of those signals and all of those subtle shifts affect the way that we communicate as marketers, and which is what I love about marketing, because it is very much evolving as the, as the culture evolves. Um, and so I realized that, yeah, there was actually a whole lot more to say about writing. So yes, I talk about AI in the second edition of the book, um, but I also just you know talk about things that were not in the first edition. It's also written in a way that is very different because we were talking about brand voice. You know, my brand, my voice has evolved as a writer because I've been writing a whole lot more over the past eight years um, because of the email newsletter, because of the confidence that that's giving, given me as a creator, because I've been creating out loud, if you will. Um, and it's, it's made me uh, sort of cement my ideas a little bit more, but also giving me the confidence to express them. There was something kind of tentative about the first edition and it was subtle. Like probably if you were to read the first edition, you wouldn't see it, you wouldn't hear it, but I feel it. Like when I read it, I feel like sometimes I was asking permission in a way to share my ideas. And I just like, I scrubbed that completely free of the second edition because there was no need for that, you know? Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks for giving us some more, some more insights. So definitely a, a book that a lot of us need to pick and, yeah, and thank you. Read. So I want to get in a couple questions from the audience. So Brian is asking, and do you believe that expansion of AI generating content will enhance the importance and relevance of communities and live events for customers, leading to greater adoption and development by brands? Chat GPT helped me rephrase this question for clarity. <laughs> oh, well done, Chat GPT, Brian. <laughs> um, yes, and uh, let me. Yes, I do think that communities are so critical to to brands um, or well, that there's new that there's new import around communities. I think that was already happening before AI, but yes, for sure, um, you know, in a world where actually, well, I was just going to say, I also think that, you know, as you saw in in this example, too, right, I, I also think that we already were, you know, embracing events um, and both virtual and in-person um, more in, you know, last year, this, even before AI. But yeah, I mean, in a world where, you know, AI is is creating content for us, I think, you know, we, we just, we, we crave that in-person connection. And, and certainly, you know, that's, AI will never take over the conversations that we have in event hallways and, you know, at, at, dinner when we're at events, right? And, and so I think it, they've always been in person, uh, important, but yeah, I think, you know, humans crave connection, we always have. And um, and so, yes, I, I definitely think that AI is going to probably drive a little bit more of that as well. Thank you. And then just one question that I wouldn't uh, forgive myself if I don't, uh, if I don't prompt this, um, this topic, but and or last the last chance uh, the last chance I had to speak to you one on one you mm -hmm. you mentioned something that was it was it was amazing in terms of going forward you think that 
artisanal content. And I love that term because mm -hmm. I, I haven't heard it before. So uh, what, what do you mean by artisanal content? You, I think if I recall correctly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you, you said in a, in a world where, you know, there's going to be so much content now, artisanal yeah. content is probably going to, become, is going to become more valuable. But what does that really mean? Yeah, well, I think we we talked about it a little bit already. You know, content that could only come from you um, that has that that is really infused with your voice, with your point of view, with your face. In in some situations, um, you know, I mean, I think my you know my email newsletter is an example of that because you know it could only come from me. Like, I, it wouldn't come from anybody else. It just would not sound the same. Um, you know, this is actually kind of an example of artisanal content, right? It's a piece of content, essentially, but you know, like, who else would draw that? Probably nobody. Um, and I think we see lots of, of different examples of that, of, of content that feels almost handcrafted uh, for us specifically. And a lot of that ultimately does play into, you know, experience and how do we actually signal to prospects and to customers that we that we care about them. Um, one just quick example, a friend of mine shared with me yesterday, um, his dog required a, a special kind of medication that he couldn't get at the local veterinary office. And so um, he had to connect with this pet um this this pet um what's the word um this this company that sells medications for pets essentially what's that word what's the word for um pharmaceutical pharmaceutical oh my god yes jeez yeah pharmaceutical really difficult word um anyway he had to connect with his pet pharmaceutical company anyway long story short ended up ordering the medication from this company this company was like a small company, but so on it and ended up um, really being very communicative in terms of, yeah, here you go. I'm sorry to hear that Minnie, Minnie is the dog's name, that Minnie requires this medication, but we'll get it to her quickly. I hope she's feeling better soon. Like that was the, that was the confirmation email for the order. Like very simple, but look at the artisanal touch there, just using the dog's name and a little bit of empathy wow. there. Like, I hope she feels better soon. Also, she, knew it was a female. I don't even know how, but they did. Um, he probably filled out some sort of profile, I'm okay. guessing, for her. But they used that data, that information, to deliver that experience. So then when the medication comes, and by the way, they said to him, your medication will be arriving today. It needs to be refrigerated, so make sure you're, you're around. We expect it will be there between 2 and 4 p.m., like that kind of thing was great. But then when it arrived, it had like a nice little handwritten note inside and a toy for Minnie to help her recover. I mean, it was just like such a nice touch and it felt very like made just for Minnie. Like I'm sure they do that for a lot of, of their customers, but he was a new new customer, right? And it what the experience that they delivered to him felt so handcrafted and handmade and artisanal just for him and for Minnie that um yeah i just love that story so another wow. example of it what, what a great story and and, and markers please take note uh because that's, that's a that's a great great way to um create customer retention and just delight the customer i i, I love yeah. it that's an amazing um story and you are fantastic as always and thank you for your uh being so generous with your time i'm sure um People in the audience love the, the the content and love the conversation. Where can people find you? So I know uh, a couple of people have posted the newsletter uh, link. So thank you very much. Uh, we were going to post it anyway uh, with the recording, but where else can people find you? Uh, oh my goodness! Um, yeah, you can you can find me at um, at annhanley.com. Um, you can sign up for my newsletter if you're if you love email. Who doesn't love email? Um, that you can sign up for that or just, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn or, or, or any of the social channels. Actually, no, let's say LinkedIn because I'll actually notice it there. Okay. Awesome. Well, um, thank you, Anne. And yeah, thank you. We, we get to have you me. again. Uh, thank you to all the audience. Again, this is crowd content. Uh, we help people create amazing content at a scale. So if you need any help, please, uh, please give us a ring. But again, thank you very much, Anne. And uh, I wish you and everybody in the audience uh, an amazing rest of the day and an amazing um, long weekend. Yeah. Oh, yes. Right. Yes. Thank you for having me. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.